Well, good afternoon and welcome to the 35th meeting of Soteria, where we will be hearing the subject of Jane Austen and Shakespeare, Hidden in Plain View, um, presented by Hewitt Wilkinson, who I think everybody here has already heard. Um, he's a fellow of the United Kingdom Council for Psychotherapy, and he's a registered psychotherapist for the UKCP. And he's written and talked many times on the subject of the Shakespeare authorship question to the De Vere Society and to others, and has the famous statement, I hope I've got this right, that Oxfordians should be postmodernist. Uh, which reminds me of a line I remember from Paul Simon's Kathy's song, which I think personally is one of the most lovely love songs ever composed, with the line, so you see, I've come to doubt all that I once held was true. And with that very brief introduction, I warmly welcome Hewitt to, to tell us about what was hidden in plain view in the works of Jane Austen. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I have noticed in the um, Oxfordian context that there's very little interest, as far as I can tell, in uh, my hypothesis about Jane Austen. And I may come later on to what the reasons might be for that. But I guess from many people's point of view, it, it is at best a curiosity. And I'll say a little bit about Jane Austen to start us off in to uh, wrote a famous essay which was published in Scrutiny um, by F.R. Leavis, who is behind me. Um, and uh, it was called, um, if I remember rightly, uh, some of them, uh, my memory is not quite what it was, and sometimes it will take a moment or two to, to retrieve something. He had found it impossible to read Jane Austen because of the image that she presented of respectability, a kind of a supposedly precious or prissy um, femininity and um, decorum and a kind of um, vicarage tea party sort of understanding of her and what Harding just ruthless writer in her own way and she was fully capable of um, saying very very painful things uh, excuse Brandon. me Hewitt, uh, Hewitt um, just uh, are other people having a problem hearing Hewitt or is it, is it just my problem because it with me it keeps getting cut off it, it, it's not, uh, yeah, it, it, it's slightly discontinuous, but yeah, slightly, I, I agree, Michael. Okay, so um, maybe if you're, if you're a bit closer to the microphone, I don't know if it's just that, but... Yeah. I don't I, think it, I don't, it's... I, I suspect it's, it, it's an internet connectivity mm, issue, but... Yeah, I think um, you're right, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, but I'm sort of worried it's good. Yes, I can hear you now, yeah. It, it, yeah, let's, let's see how it goes. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, see how it goes yeah. To plough on. In the um, so what I was saying about uh, Harding's view of Jane Austen was that he discovered that she was all the things that he liked and she passed herself off her reasons of uh, being available to a wider audience. Um, as all the things that have interested her in her indeed. And um, what I've gone on discovering is that 
um, there's layer after layer of uh, unexpected discoveries Austin and her ways of communicating. And yet, of course, she managed to conduct herself in such a way that she's become a national icon in this country. And um, there are three people who have been on our banknotes who are writers, uh, unless you count uh, Charles Darwin, for example, or Isaac Newton as writers, but I mean literary writers. Um, and the first was Shakespeare, who was on um, the 20 pound note. Um, Charles Dickens, and the third was Jane Austen, who is on our £10 note and uh, um, is in, in sort of way that the people's image of her is. So she is very hidden. Uh, at times, she protests against hiddenness in the uh, novel that I'm going to discuss, which is Emma. Uh, but at times, she obviously enjoys hiding and being cryptic and hard. And I'm going to give you one or two examples, but just to, uh, as a kind of testimony to her robustness, um, refer to a footnote by G.M. Young, in, which is in Victorian England, Portrait of an Age. My glasses. He quotes Keats. He's trying, he's trying to talk about the education of women in the 19th century and its limitations, but also its power. And Keats had written in 1817, when of course he was in um, affected phase. He toughened up a great deal later, of course. God, she is like a um, that bleats for man's protection. And um, a young comments, indeed, but this is Keats, 1817, and is Rousseau's Sophie rather than fielding Sophia. And then he adds, one does not easily picture Emma Woodhouse, 1816. <laughs> Emma Woodhouse is a formidable character, and so is her counterpart, Jane Fairfax. Jane Fairfax is profoundly hidden. Emma is out in the open, but is profoundly self-deceived. And there's a psychology of self-deception that uh, Jane Austen is offering in this work, which is of quite a phenomenal character. And I do think, I believe is hidden within it, an understanding of the Shakespeare authorship question. Uh, I cannot obviously um, put the case for Jane Austen's understanding of this other than in one or two I pursue. Um, but I will uh, make a case for the possibility of this argument. And I'll do that in terms of allusions within Emma, which are quite open in the book. Uh, Emma Woodhouse refers, and she's talking to Harriet about uh, her, her supposed uh, impending engagement with Mr. Elton, the, the vicar. Um, she says to um, uh, that and, um, uh, uh, Stuart, I, I don't know about other people, but I'm getting a really problem listening to, I wondered, uh, it very often works technically, if you log off and log on again, it might yeah, just do the trick. Because uh, it, it, it's, it's such a trying. pity, I mean, it's such an interesting subject, and then you keep, um, you keep getting cut off, you probably don't notice anything your end, but yeah. uh, our end. It, it, it's not going to do any harm, so maybe yeah. do that, Hewitt. Uh, 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 yeah.
Yeah. Um, did, did, did you hear Michael's suggestion? Uh, if, if, if you log out and log back in, it, it might um, uh, mean you, you, you will have a, a more secure connection. But at the moment, it, it's, yeah, would that be possible to do? Give it a try. I think. Uh, I don't know if he looks logged off or, or frozen. Or he looks. He looks as if he's just frozen. Yeah. Uh, and I. Oh. Right. Oh. I, okay. No, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, and that's the other thing. Sometimes without your picture, if you have a very weak connection, that can help because yeah, it's, it's yeah. not such a load. Yeah, that, that that might be worth doing, just just, just making it audio. Um, nice seeing his books, but it's, his voice is more important. Hello, uh, so yeah, let's see if that works. And also, if it if there's still a problem, another possibility is to switch off the camera. But yeah. Let, let, let's see if that works. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I was about to say was that, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Saying the net connection is unstable, but I don't know why that is. Um, I'm taking a, uh, an example which is perfectly in the book in Emma, uh, where Emma Woodhouse says to Harriet Smith that uh, a Hartfield edition of A Midsummer Night's Dream would have a lot of commentary to make on the course of true love never. Uh, Hugh, uh, yeah. can, can we try, sorry to interrupt you, can, can, can we try it just audio? It, it might be a bit smoother because it's it's still quite jumpy for us, I'm, I'm afraid. I, I'm yeah. terribly uh, sorry, but just, yeah. If, if, if you could just mute the video, then it, it might help. Might help might, a little might, bit. Yeah. Can you all? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Can but now. It, it comes and goes. That's yeah, problem. let's, yeah, yeah let's. Uh, so, oh, that's very good test, though. What, how just can one complete the quotation? The, cor the course of true love. Did never run so smooth as uh, it's from it's it's never from Midsummer Night's Dream. Yes, um, from uh, Midsummer Night's um, Dream, I think. The old edition of Shakespeare would have a long footnote on that remark. You see, in her delusional belief that uh, the espousal of Mr. Elton and Harriet Smith is due shortly to happen. And of course, the irony is that the, the whole of Emma, in very subtle ways, is modelled upon A Midsummer Night's Dream. Are you all hearing me? Yes. Okay. So, plow on. Uh, uses illusions. Uh, in this quite open and above board case um, to illustrate her methodology. And then I'm going to make the link with the argument that I'm bringing to bear. And then I'll go on to the second part of the talk, which is about the enigma of why she hid this information in the text so profoundly. Okay. Connections yeah. with um, uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, and one of them is to be found uh, in its in very subtle um, and would be just ridden over by most people. Uh, but it in fact is not. Um, hang on a sec. Emma is talking to Harriet Smith, and um, Harriet is displaying ostensibly her intelligence to Emma because there is no coincidence. So um, 
they're talking about Robert Martin and um, Emma says to Harriet, I have no doubt of his being a very, very respectable man. Indeed that he is so, and as such, I wish him well. What do you imagine his age to be? And then Harriet says, My birthday is the 23rd, just a fortnight and a day's difference, which is very odd. And then it goes on, 20 being too young an age to marry. Uh, but and, and that all seems to fit in with the um, uh, ostensible meaning of the text. But actually, the statement of Harriet, her birthday, which is going to be her 18th birthday, is going to be on Midsummer Night's Eve. It's going to be on the 23rd of June. And that the time when they all find themselves at Donwell Abbey uh, looking at Mr Knightley's strawberries and that episode is a very remarkable and significant one. Can you still hear me? We, we, we Ed, can, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Sometimes it cuts off, but I can just, yeah. it's a bit of a strain, but it's such an interesting subject. I'm still in there, so yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, I, it's funny. It's funny though that because you've never had problems before, Hewitt, and I, we've never had problems hearing you. Just why it should be different today, I really don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, yes. I mean, it could be different servers, and there's all sorts of reasons. Yeah. Anyway, let, let's plow on. Mm -hmm. um, this is an. Where's uh, Stead gone? I'm still here. I'm just. I'm just. Uh, Oh, I see, right. Yeah, he, he, eating a sandwich or doing something that you don't want to see, then he puts exactly. that Exactly. Yeah. So, um, there's also the reference in this passage to four and twenty. Now, it's a reference to Robert Martin's A. Post with the 23rd of June, we may assume that Jane Austen is also alluding to the 24th of June. Now, the 24th of June in Emma is another summer day. And that so, so what, what is the 24th of June? That's an interesting point, and I'm afraid it went off. What, what is the 24th of June? John Eve. It's a Midsummer Night's Day. No, ah. John's Eve. Ah. It, it, not adjusted for the solstices in the mm. way ours is. That in the 18th century, mm. Midsummer Night. I mean, is, is it not St. John's Eve? You, you, or something? Not, I don't know all about it, but let me plow oh. on. Yeah. Um, now, is the visit to Donwell Abbey, and the 24th is the famous visit to Box Hill, where Emma insults. Um, uh, and where um, uh, behaves in such a blatant way in flirting with Emma that uh, Jane Fairfax reaches the conclusion that she must break off the engagement. Now, of course, the latter is so 23rd and 24th of June are very significant dates. And here has Jane Austen alluded to them, but alluded to them in a way that most people will know. On. Okay, another allusion to um, A Midsummer Night's Dream. And guess what? Who is being alluded to in this one? Um, Bottom the Weaver. Now, you remember what happens to Bottom the Weaver at the hands of uh, um, uh, Oberon and uh, in the relationship with Titania? He's turned into an ass. And he has a visionary experience which he uh, describes in very Pauline language when he, uh, he returns to himself. 
at the end of the whole process. Well, in the Donwell Abbey visit on the 23rd of June, what does Mrs. Elton want and suggest to Mr. Knightley but that they should all go there on donkeys? Now, Emma is a drawing room comedy even when it's out of doors. Very unobtrusive reference. But once you make the link with the Midsummer Night's Eve and the Midsummer Night's Day, lo and behold, there you have Bottom as the Ass hidden there, and you start to make connections with Mrs. Elton and Mr. Knightley and who is who and so on and so forth. So again, that's another um, hardly visible uh, illusion. Um, and so uh, I mean, there, there are others, but in, again, as you like it, on um, the page after the donkey episode, um, which is page three, two, six, three, six. Um, we have a conversation between Mr. Knightley and Mrs. Elton, and um, Mrs. Elton uh, alludes to, as you like it, with the very words. And when I want to find them, of course. Um, Anyway, um, she finishes a sentence. I've now found it, okay. Ah, says Mrs. We uh, Mrs. Elton, you are an odd creature. She cried, satisfied to have no one preferred to herself. You are a humorist and may say what you like, quite a humorist. Well, I shall bring Jane with me, Jane and her aunt. The rest I leave to you, etc., etc. And then the next paragraph, I, I'll call on Mrs. Bates on my way home, says Mr. Knightley. That is quite unnecessary. I see Jane every day, but as you like, full stop, it is to be a morning scheme that you know Knightley, quite a simple thing. And then uh, they go into the um, uh, Al Fresco out of doors. Um, uh, fantasy of um, a, a, a picnic, which is what uh, Mrs. Elton wants, though previously Jane Austen, in her rather contemptuous way, has said that uh, it would it didn't need to have been strawberry beds. Cabbage beds would have been enough to have appeal to the lady. She only wanted to be going. the occasional stabbing aspect of uh, Jane Austen's malice coming up there. So there again is another reference to Shakespeare. And all this is fairly well in the open because that chapter, for anyone who knows as you like it, and anyone who knows that chapter, is um, a green world fantasy in the sort of way that the wanderings in the forest in As You Like It are a green world All that is out in the open. And all I want to do now is to call attention to two examples of um, how parallel connections are made, uh, which allude to Shakespeare and the authorship question in ways that are not obvious in the text. Now, I gradually be, it gradually became clear to me, uh, if anyone has read the thing I wrote, 
that um, uh, the three great tragedies, King Lear, Hamlet and Macbeth are all in there. And I found my way to the um, uh, King Lear passage uh, uh, about poor Tom, at the moment when um, the fool goes into the hovel and King Lear goes because they've encountered poor Tom, uh, who is Edgar in disguise, uh, behaving as a madman. And uh, the allusion to that is incredibly thin, uh, but it's enough if you're already looking for it to think maybe there's something here, but you can't prove it. But you, you know that she has Hamlet and Macbeth lying in the uh, of what she's doing. And uh, I looked for it and then I found it. This is mo the most recent discovery I've made. Won't be the last. Towards the end of the novel, when uh, the betrothals have taken place, Churchill and Emma is openly, can, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yes. It just said my connection is unstable. There's a reconciliation moment between Jane Fairfax and Emma Woodhouse. And um, uh, Jane Fairfax starts apologizing to Emma, but Emma is full of guilt feelings about the bad way in which she's treated Jane Fairfax during her delusional phase. And uh, she says to her, oh, you are too scrupulous. Indeed you are. You owe me no apologies. Everyone to whom you might be supposed to owe them is so perfectly satisfied, so delighted even. And then Jane Fairfax cuts across her. You are very kind, but I know what my manners were to you. So it was a life of deceit. I know that I must have disgusted you. And then Emma says, pray say no more. Be on my side. Let us forgive each other at once. We must do whatever is to be done quickest, and I think our feelings will lose no time there. I hope you have very pleasant account, uh, accounts from Windsor. Very. And there are two illusions, possibly three there. And uh, the first one is to Hamlet. This is when uh, Laertes and Hamlet have wounded each other with the poisoned foil, and um, uh, the uh, Laertes says um, after the king dies, he is justly served. It is a poison tempered by himself. Exchange forgiveness with me, noble Hamlet. Mine and my father's death come thine on me. And the second illusion, which is the characteristic um, sentence type illusion. I'll read the sentence again. The second one, the first one to um, Hamlet, which each other at once. I feel that all the apologies should be on my side. Let us forgive each other at once. Uh, in Hamlet, it is easy. Then it goes on. We must do whatever is to be done quickest. And I think our feelings will lose no time there. With which compare, if it were done when tis done, then for well it were done quickly. 
if the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success that but this blow might be the be all and here upon this bank and shoal of time, we'd jump the life to come. That very awkward sentence is called and I believe it's very clear cut that it's an allusion to uh, scene seven of Macbeth, the, the opening lines. If it is done for well, it were done quickly. And I think our feelings will lose no time there. But here, here, but here upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. And for good measure, the third connection, triangulation. I hope you have pleasant accounts from Windsor. And lo and behold, she answers, to the via name, which, whilst it's um, uh, repeated by Oxfordians ad nauseum, nevertheless, it's a fairly whacking great clue when it turns up. And in the um, uh, key passage in the uh, 20th chapter of the novel, it turns up in spades, and we have um, uh, the illusions which are um, if you if you do not um, if you if you took them alone, you would think there was nothing in it, um, and I would not hold it against anybody who persists and think there's nothing in it. But what happened? What is said? Uh, he's talking about how uh, Jane Fairfax got an education. Passionate feelings of a friend of her father, who has been killed in the wars, um, uh, Lieutenant Bates, in, in the war. Um, the compassionate feelings of a friend of her father gave a change to her destiny. This was Colonel Campbell, who had very highly regarded Fairfax as an excellent officer and most deserving young man. Deserving is the first one, and further had been indebted to him for such attentions during a severe which he believed had saved his life. So that's three de Veres or Veres or um, so on in from uh, upon Appleton House, the Marvel poem, which is uh, dedicated to the daughter of Lord Thomas Fairfax, uh, of, of whose tutor Andrew Marvell was. There is a famous uh, stanza, um, uh, thus twas it to have been nursed under the discipline severe of Fairfax and the starry veer. Severe camp fever, and we have discipline on the next page. She, her heart and understanding had received every advantage of discipline and culture. Now, any one of these by itself could be put down as coincidence. It believes that if you have a whole cluster of them, and uh, I've spelt out the five or six complexes of them in my paper, um, the circumstantial evidence becomes too powerful to ignore. But let us consider it as a hypothesis only for the moment. Um, we can come back to discussing all that. Um, what I want to go on to now is what is going on that Jane Austen hides this in such a way 
that firstly, for me, if I hadn't known, if I hadn't already known the Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford hypothesis, I would never have found it in the text. There's no question in my mind of that. Um, but it would appear that Jane Austen not only knew there was a Shakespeare authorship problem, if this is correct, but also knew the solution to it was that the actual author was Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford. And yet she conceals it. Uh, I don't know of anyone else who has argued the case that I'm arguing in the last 200 years. Maybe someone has someone along the way because it makes me feel a bit less mad than I actually do feel. But there it is. Even if, if you, grant, you grant that uh, Jane Austen therefore knew both sets of things, she knew there was an authorship problem and she knew that what the solution to it was. Um, and uh, she also weaves in um, allusions to us in the authorship issue uh, to Canto One in what the chapter I call Mr. Knightley's um, detective work, which is the one that comes immediately before um, the Donwell uh, the Donwell visit and portrays him as a very broken man. Um, a rather saintly, Christ-like figure who is being belittled by um, uh, Emma, um, who is not what he's trying to tell her. And uh, that uh, runs parallel with the false dream that occurs in that chapter. The And again, I, I, I can't go into that argument now, but it seems to me very clear cut circumstantially that Jane Austen has planted enough allusions and cross connections in that chapter as to make it pretty well beyond doubt. Um, so um, we have that whole complex, but um, not only is it the case that, as far as I know, no one has alluded to it in 200 years, and it would then be the earliest formal allusion to the De Vere hypothesis 100 years before John Thomas Looney. Um, but also, um, uh, the, the obscurity of it, means that it's certainly arguable that she minimized the possibility of anyone discovering it at all. All that I want to talk about, what was going on. And uh, here, Um, the hypothesis that uh, only her Christianity sustains her. In relying on the possibility that sooner or later, somehow it will be discovered. Uh, I make the comparison in the most recent thing I've written, which I think is uh, in the what was circulated. Uh, with Jared Manley Hopkins, who uh, she was, and therefore, in effect, Hopkins wrote for three individuals: Robert Bridges, Canon Dixon, and Coventry Patmore, and God. And nevertheless, he he wrote the greatest poetry, the second part of the nineteenth um, uh, century in England. So there's something going on here. And the conclusion I've come to is that the 
key reference to As You Like It, which is in what I call Emma's epiphany, when she prompted by Harriet Smith's belief that she may possibly be um, uh, loved by Mr. Knightley, and that wakes up Emma to her love for Mr. Knightley, which has been unconscious up to this point. And the, this is the passage which is a very moving passage. But now, found into weaving in it, which I didn't notice for 60 years. Harriet says, uh, in response to Emma's question, have you any idea of Mr. Knightley's returning your affection? Yes, replied Harriet modestly, but not fearfully. I must say that I have. Emma's eyes were instantly withdrawn and she sat silently meditating in a fixed attitude for a few minutes. A few minutes with making her acquainted with her own heart, a mind like hers, once opening to suspicion, made rapid progress. truth. Why was it so much worse that Harriet should be in love with Mr. Knightley than with Frank Churchill? Why was the e evil so dreadfully increased? It darted through her with the speed of an arrow that Mr. Knightley must marry no one but herself. And in that passage, firstly, what um, Bruce Stovell argues, and he was a fairly traditional Austin critic, very good one, um, what he argues is that you would not expect it to go straight to marriage. And um, uh, Bruce Stoville writes, here we reach my third idea. The change that brings into being a new Emma is not instantaneous or total. The very words in which Emma first acknowledges the whole truth about her love for Mr. Knightley suggest that the new Emma is still enmeshed in the old. And then we have the kind of half perception of uh, Austin critics. Quote, it darted through her with the speed of an arrow that Mr. Knightley must marry no one but herself. Jocelyn Harris aptly remarks, that arrow must be the arrow of the blind boy Cupid. That's a half, that's quite correct, but it's a half perception because it darted through her with the speed of an arrow. The dart is also Cupid's dart. So Jane Austen has put it, put two for the price of one in there, and she's telling us something. Furthermore, she has used dart on three previous occasions in the novel. Once when she's talking about the impending engagement of uh, Mr. Weston to Miss Taylor, which is what starts the novel off, the marriage between them. Once when um, uh, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Weston, that was Miss Taylor, is talking about her hypothesis that uh, Mr. Knightley uh, may be in love with Jane Fairfax and that it's he that uh, has uh, brought the piano in, which is uh, in Miss um, Miss Bates's uh, living room. Uh, and the third one is when Mr. Knightley in the, in the detective work chapter is trying to, leaning over the shoulder of um, Harriet Smith to make out what Emma uh, has, put before, has had put before her 
by Frank Churchill, and it's the word Dixon. And um, Mr. Knightley darted his gaze. And of course, Mr. Knightley has uh, indicated in more than one way, and is going to even more in the following chapter, that he is dedicated, he's committed to marriage. And in looking over the shoulder of um, the letters that is being given to Jane Fairfax, he's of course preoccupied with Emma. So it's always connected with marriage. And here there is a double connection with marriage. So the, it's not just about the musts as um, Joel Coville says, it's about the marriage and the uh, allusions to marriage. And that means that the allusion to marriage is quite definite in its own right, and that it uh, connects up with the passage in As You Like It, where uh, Touchstone encounters William, and uh, Touchstone says to William, uh, obviously William Sh Shakespeare of Stratford-on-Avon, uh, may well be being alluded to in this passage. You do love this maid, that's Audrey. William, I do, sir. Touchstone, give me your hand, art thou learned? No, sir. Touchstone, then learn this of me. To have is to have, for it is a figure in rhetoric that drink being poured out of a cup into a glass by filling the one doth empty the other, for all your writers do consent that Ipsy is he. Now you are not Ipsy, for I am he. And William says, which he, sir? And Touchstone says, he, sir, that must marry this woman. Mr. Knightley must marry no one but herself, and the herself is the English for the Latin ipsi. And that allusion for Oxfordians, it's the first allusion that is on the De Vere Society uh, website, and it is the classic allusion of the double authorship theory, the front man and the uh, actual writer behind the front, front man which Nina Green in particular has called such attention to. So again, if you follow my hypothesis, that's why there is a reference straight on to marriage there and not just to being in love. Now what um, Stovell points out is that all three films about Emma that were produced in the 90s he says all three film versions of Emma produced 95 to 96, Gwyneth Paltrow, Kate Beckinsale, and the Beverly Hills High film adaptation Clueless, the heroine exclaims at this moment, I love him. That's the natural progression. So if Jane Austen bucks the natural progression, she's doing it for a reason. And that was what first brought home to me that she's quite definitely alluding to the Oxfordian hypothesis relevant passages of as you like it. And my view is that she is also by bringing in the three great tragedies, she and by bringing in Andrew Marvell's Pon Appleton House, um, Andrew Mar Marvell, the author of uh, a Horatian ode, upon uh, Oliver Cromwell's return from Ireland, Jane Austen is alluding to the whole history of this period and the transformations that have gone on. And she's conducting a kind of cryptogram of it in the evolution of Emma's experience from a kind of crass and out of date feudalism, which it means that she rejects Robert Martin as a member of the yeomanry uh, to the more moderate feudalism that is Mr. Knightley's vision also 
where hierarchy continues to be uh, espoused, but people can move up and down the hierarchy in one way and another. And so I came back to that passage in the light of the widened, uh, the wider story. And I'm now pretty well convinced that in the sentence, the three part sentence, she touched, which is also an allusion to touchstone, she touched, she admitted, she acknowledged the whole truth. I think that that is a replication, not in the same words, but with the same rhythm of the authorized version of I am the way, the truth, and the life of John chapter 14, verse 6. No one comes to the Father but through me. And I believe that there is a hidden Christian allegory running through this novel very powerfully. And uh, this is one of the places where it emerges. I believe that uh, George Knightley, who is not given the name of the patron saint and the monarch at that time of England, uh, George for nothing. And there's also um, Emma's play with uh, George because she never calls him George, but she says she will call him George in the place where um, N is betrothed to or takes M for better for worse at the end of the novel, she says. And of course, uh, if you pronounce nightly, you pronounce it with a silent K. So N takes M and M is short for Emma. And so she's doing a play on words at that point, which calls our attention to the fact that Mr. Knightley's name has never been acknowledged by her in the novel with the, all that that signifies. And I believe that um, Jane Austen, who was a, a very learned uh, um, um, pastor's daughter, um, also would have known that the word for truth in um, Hebrew, in the Johannine, the way, the truth, and the life, the middle one, is em et. So I think there's an allusion to Emma, and I think there's an allusion to Mr. Knightley as a, a low-key Christ figure. Um, and goodness knows she put him through enough. And the Red Cross, the allusion uh, to the Red Cross Knight in the detective work fact, uh, 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 chapter um, uh, of uh, Spencer is also what clinches it for me. Um, and that she, she is associating her recognition of the realities of the authorship situation with the predicament of Christianity and the possibility of the, if you like, Bunyan-esque hiddenness of the true Christian amongst the heathen or amongst uh, the, um, um, uh, the, the bad people of the world. And um, it is a very, very subtle Christian parable. And as such, she was willing to accept that in some way, the actual Shakespeare was caught up in a kind of massive suppression, which was a historical pro uh, um, suppression, not just a malicious one, as Oxfordians office often think that it was engineered by certain people like the Cecils, 
Now, I'm not saying that they weren't involved, um, but that something about the historical process, and here I connect it with 1688 and the bloodless revolution by which James II was deposed and William of Orange and his wife uh, came to the throne. And in effect, we in England had the constitutional monarchy we have had ever since from that. And um, uh, I think that Jane Austen, I think the deliberate inclusion of upon Appleton House and its allusions to the anti-regicide uh, Thomas Fairfax, who uh, would not accept Cromwell's uh, slaughter of, the, of Charles I, and was therefore able to be a mediator at the time of the restoration. I think that Jane Austen is saying there's been a very powerful, very complicated historical evolution here. We are still in it because of my revered teacher, the great Dr. Johnson, Dr. Samuel Johnson, the Stratfordian theory is now established beyond a doubt in the majority of commentators. If I try to get this out into the open, we can come back to the banknotes. Lord Byron is never going to be on a British banknote nor is D.H. Lawrence, whatever their merits. And the problem with Edward de Vere is that although he undoubtedly had very profound Christian leanings, nevertheless, he was a scapegrace in many ways. And uh, he's alluded to by Sir Walter Scott in um, uh, Kennel Kenilworth as um, an unthrift a spendthrift and uh, and he ought to be um, mad bad and dangerous to know as Caroline Lamb said about Lord Baron. Edward de Vere was mad bad and dangerous to know and it could not have been someone who was not mad bad and dangerous to know who composed those works. They are demonic works as well as works of grace. They straddle the whole spectrum of human good and evil in a, in a way that is incomparable. And what Jane Austen, I believe, is telling us is that she understands all that and that hidden within the mastery of a domestic drawing room comedy, Emma, was something which is as light in its own way as Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest um, is nevertheless hidden within it is a profound understanding of tragedy and it's only just averted in the way that it's sometimes only just averted in Shakespeare's own comedies. So I think that that vision enabled her to in some sense, or in an almost Hegelian sense, to trust in historical process, not knowing what the outcome would be, but that nevertheless it was worth, in some way, recording this testimony. It wasn't just a futile exercise in a private whim. So that's as far as I've got with it, folks. Thank, thank you very, very much. I think it was far too uh, recondite for me to, 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 to follow, but I'm sure Michael will have some response well, that's more sure. educated. <laughs> well, no, I found it fascinating, uh, Hugh. Absolutely fascinating. I'm glad to say, by the way, um, the interruptions became steadily less. So by the end, you were almost not being interrupted at all. Uh, okay. I did miss a bit at the beginning. Um, I, I'm still, for me, it's still a question. Uh, first of all, I absolutely agree that I think those illusions are being made. You know Emma much better. I've only read Emma twice. I think you've read Emma at least a dozen times, uh, probably more. Um, but I, I, 
didn't see those references, but when you point them out like a lot of things, then it's obvious once it's pointed out. Um, where I'm still uncertain is perhaps I missed something because your talk was a little difficult to follow for the technical reason sometimes. Why did Jane Austen not want to speak about her belief that de Vere was, it's a very simple question, uh, the, uh, the author of, of Shakespeare? I think, it, I think in a manner of speaking, um, it was for the same reason that Churchill didn't want to speak about it. Churchill took the line that the Stratfordian model was the national myth, mm. the, self, the self made man, the man emerging uh, in, into a new lease of life as the self made man from the provinces after the 1688 revolution and during the transformation of the 18th century, where it is absolutely crucial to the understanding of Emma, which Lionel Trilling points out, that it has become possible for someone very capable to rise through the ranks in the dispensation that now prevails. It's difficult and it's hard work and you can't do it instantly, but you can do it. And therefore, the safe self-made man model had become very important. Of course, it became even more important during the 19th century. And therefore, the national myth, as it were, of the, the alliance of the aristocracy with the intelligent masses, especially in time of war, and especially in time of capitalism, and the, the inventors of you know the the steam engine, the spinning jenny, and all that uh, that suddenly was becoming very important at that time, and Jane Austen would have understood that. Therefore, the Stratfordian myth again, Samuel Johnson, who was also a, a, a young man made good from the provinces, like David Garrick, and David Garrick and Jet Samuel Johnson combined in a sense to put the Stratfordian myth into concrete because Johnson wrote the apotheosis of the Stratfordian position in the preface to Shakespeare 1765 and then uh, Garrick conducted the Stratford festival of 1769 and after that the young man from the province was more or less deified in the latter mm. years of the 18th mm. century. And Jane Austen would have understood all of that. Who, who, who was the first person to put the case for the Earl of Oxford? Uh, and when was that? The first person to put the case for the Earl of Oxford as the dominant author, spelt out as a general thesis, was John Thomas Looney. Oh, who, uh, that who was it. That, um, sorry, well, when was that then? That was that, that was that would have been during the First World War. The book came right. out in 1920, mm. 20, I think. So um, you're you're saying that Jane Austen believed that before the case was generally framed? Absolutely, yes. And I okay. I also think she took it as totally obvious. Yeah. Now, at the, my problem in some ways with the Oxfordian mm. thesis is I do think it's totally obvious mm. once you look into it. And as it were, a hard headed mm. thinker would take it as totally obvious now. What, um, what would her source of information have been about the existence? of? I the have no Oxford? idea. And I, I do not have any idea whether she figured mm. it out for herself mm. or whether it was part of a, a general secret currency amongst mm. the cognoscenti of the time. I it's, think it's quite possible she figured it out for herself because but, she, she's so powerful a detective. Mm. But now, nowadays, you know, we've got access to a kind of names, an, an unlimited number of names with the internet. But before that, um, 
information about uh, things was was not was not in ready supply. Therefore, um, one would one would have to have read something or heard something to, to know about. Uh, you know, uh, information doesn't exist in the ether. So I suppose it, it, it yeah it it, it, it uh, yeah there has to be an actual source because otherwise I mean yeah um, the Earl of Oxford. I mean he's not part of general history, did he or is he? It, well, he was then. Was it? Yes. So it, it, he's only yeah, yeah. been he's he's only been airbrushed out of the record since Looney established his hypothesis. He's been airbrushed out of the record precisely because people, the Stratfordian people, do mm. not want him in there. So, for example, there's a there's a picture at uh, Dulwich College, which is now known as the Lady Lady in Blue. Uh, in the 19th century, it was known to everybody that it was uh, Lady Susan Vere, the daughter of um, the daughter of um, um, Edward de Vere, the third daughter. Likewise, uh, the irony of this is that the, the, the latest film of Emma was filmed at Wilton House. Now, Wilton House is a magnificent painting by um, Van Dyck, which shows the whole family of Philip Montgomery, including his first wife, who is portrayed uh, in a uh, kind of ghostly colors because she's dead. Ah, uh -huh. that's why. Yeah, okay. And it's virtually no one now will admit that the person in that portrait was Susan Veer and not Lady Anne Clifford, uh, Montgomery's second wife. Um, and of course, Montgomery hmm. and uh, the Earl of Pembroke, the Earl of Pembroke who um, courted um, uh, Edward de Vere's second daughter and um, the Earl of Derby is a connection here who married um, the Earl of Oxford's first daughter and Philip Montgomery married the Earl of Oxford's third daughter. All of that would have been known to Jane Austen because the interest in the peerage and the lineages of things was even more massive than it is for certain people today using the internet. So I think it, uh, I think it, if, if you were a really good sleuth, which Jane Austen was, and if you had the will to find this out, if you smelt a very large rat about this authorship question, and you set about finding it, the evidence is there. The evidence is in the commendatory verses at the beginning of the Fairy Queen. Mm. And it's in things like um, uh, uh, Nash, Nash's preface to um, Green's Menophon, where he talks about whole hamlets. Uh, and this is in um, about uh, 1588, uh, about 12 years before the official writing time of Hamlet. Do you, do you know whether Jane Austen uh regularly uh, visited uh, large libraries that could be, you know, called research libraries, you know, university father, libraries or, father, you know. Her father had one. She was brought up by a-, a Oh, he, 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 had, had, he had a large library, did he? He had a large oh, library. Oh, okay, that's interesting, yeah, okay. Yeah. And, well, and she read everything she could get her hands on. Yeah. I, I believe she she wrote a lot of letters, of which few survive. So, so uh, that, that's why. Cassandra, Cassandra destroyed a lot. Oh of yeah, uh, Janine, please say something. First of all, I want to say the the argument about the the um, kind of the Horatio Alger kind of approach to uh, the success of, of of someone of the lower class. We even see that in America today, where African American writers they can write the most unbelievable garbage, but because of the politics, 
you're not allowed to say, you're not allowed to have a, a negative or let's say an objective, a kind of a historical literary approach to criticism because of who the writer is. And I'm, and I'm thinking that, that that's probably what is going on with Jane Austen. She's no fool. If you want to write a book and have people read it, you know what, what you know, ox you can gore and what ox you cannot gore. And, I, and that's what I got from um, um, part of what your remarks were. The, 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 the pressure is on, uh, not unlike what happened during slavery, if, if you want to express unpopular ideas, you have to camouflage it in a way that only people mm. who are, are, are very well acquainted with the issues are going to understand. Now, having said that, let's look at J.K. Rowling, who right, it's a wildly uh, successful person. And yet there is this, and I don't know if it's mythology or not, that when she first went to the publisher, the publisher said, this is absolutely unpublishable. You have to get an editor to make some sort of sense out of, you know, you've got a great idea and you've got great characters and whatever, but it's not commercially viable until we get it into that form where it, it's going to pass inspection for a larger audience. Now, having said that, let me go on to say, it's so odd that I heard you mention Oscar Wilde, because in my notes, I thought to myself that you were discussing the conversation between these women, and that it reminded me exactly of the conversation between the women in uh, The Importance of Being Earnest, almost to the point where it's like, hmm, were these people contemporaries? Obviously not, but it, it just has that, that ring uh, to it of the way that women disguise negative emotions towards one another because polite people don't do that especially polite women and when you say that she is the daughter of a preacher obviously she's she's going to be more circumspect in her references to her friends now according to uh, um said your your remark about uh did she know? Was was she aware? It's my understanding that at that time, the 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 range of friendships was such that people would understand her references. Um, me being a, a noir fan, whenever I hear the words, uh, you know, I'm 35, no visible scars, immediately I know what that means. To the ordinary person, they may not know. It, it's just a remark that a writer is making. But for those who have studied that the other genre, that is a direct reference to double indemnity. That the, the, it's a quote right right out of the movie, out of the book. So I can see where where you're going with with this idea of it's not code. What it is is an understanding of a group of people who are speaking a a second language of literary knowledge that other people don't have. And because of the circle of friends probably was smaller because they did not have mass communication, the people and the circles that Jane would have, Jane Austen would have moved in, would have probably been able to understand these references in a way that now we have to go back and deconstruct, where at the time, and we and we I have no way of knowing if this is true or not, that that the people that she was writing and were reading her texts um, would probably understand in in a way that, that we can't. Why? We're, we're, yeah, we're it's, di it's difficult to evaluate, isn't it, from this uh, point? Yeah, uh, may may I, I, I'd like to sort of give think that that's very, very interesting, going back to my original question, because we sort of went down a sidetrack, but it's sort of almost coming back again. And my question, I'll just sort of reinforce it, is was Jane Austen, well, then put it slightly differently now, was Jane Austen hiding this or concealing this in plain view because she did not want to spoil the myth? Uh, I can't remember who, it's, who said, la vérité n'est pas toujours révolutionnaire. You know, truth is not always revolutionary. Or some famous Marxist said that. <laughs> right. uh, okay, was it that? Because yeah. if we reveal this truth, we are destroying a necessary myth of progress. Or was it because 
she was conceding it simply for more banal commercial reasons or propriety, or she would have been laughed at or frowned at, or her book wouldn't have been sold. Or was it some combination mm. of both? Or do we have no idea? Or was is the did she actually have no idea about this? But it's just it's a perception of those who who do have that belief, and it uh, allows them to read it into circumstances which may have a different explanation. That's the other. Well, well uh, you see that, that if if you assume that my hypothesis has at least a chance of being right, uh, yeah. What you've just indicated, Stead, is mm. how brilliant, brilliantly she achieved plausible deniability. Mm. She managed to write in such a way that even if one thinks oneself to have discovered this, even as the person who thinks himself to have discovered it, I'm still not sure whether I'm not projecting something into the text. Mm. Every yeah. time I go back to the, the, the connections, I have to remind myself of the degrees of triangulation which she actually achieves. And even then, I'm still doubtful. So she yeah, that, she's that, that, that's on the speaks edge. well of you. That speaks well. I mean, the, the human mind is very successful uh, uh, in some sense because it's able to uh, project in, into circumstances and make hypotheses and act on them. And that's that is a is a is a big ability that that, that we have to see and patterns. Course, yeah, that is course, very good. Of course, the study of Emma <laughs> up to the moment of her epiphany is precisely projection and self-deception because her head, she immediately leaps on it. She doesn't critique it. There's no hypothetical deductive challenge to, to counter evidence. She just goes with it when she thinks that there's an association between uh, Jane Fairfax and um, uh, Mr. Dixon in Ireland, who's married her best friend. Um, she just goes with it. She never critiques it, not further. Or she... I suppose it, it, it might be uh, useful to put this in the form of some kind of paper and submit it to a Jane Austen uh, journal and to see what the response would be. Well, that might be interesting. I don't know. Member of the Jane Austen Society of North America. And I have... Oh, oh I see. Oh, sorry. Did you say that Janine is? No, I... Oh, oh you are. You are the... Oh, of, of, okay. of Jasna, the Jane Austen Society of North America. Oh, right. Oh, OK. And right. I personally believe that the odds are they would not publish oh, me huh? writing this hypothesis to them. In other words, I think the position that Jane Austen was in then is still the case for anyone who takes... Mm would take the Oxfordian case about Jane Austen. So if I, I can put it in, because I'm still nailing to get an answer to this. She, in your view, she did this because it would have, uh, she hid it because it would have been considered inappropriate or disadvantageous to her, or she would have been frowned upon if she had openly stated her belief. Is that... Yeah, but I, I think it would have been second nature. I mean, um, there's an interchange between Mr. Weston and Emma, where Emma thinks to herself, um, uh, the, the, the remark that the narrator makes is, uh, Emma, uh, em, Emma agreed with, with all of it out loud and with none of it in, in private, or words to that effect. Mm. Yes. I, I don't. I think you're. I think you're. I think if you sent this uh, paper to the right people, I think they would snap it up in a heartbeat. Because mm. why? After listening to your argumentation, and believe me, there are people in America who still admire uh, good argumentation and presenting evidence for yeah. for a position taken. 
I, mm. I think you're I think you're wrong. I think there is a market and I think that there is every opportunity. I found it fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And I watched the presentation on YouTube that you made uh, and it, it just was enraptured. Um, I do think that, it, that the evidence that you present and you say it's circumstantial, I'm, I think that there is hard evidence in terms of historical um, situations that that are very very persuasive so i i'm i'm not quite sure if if mm. this this piece is isn't um quite frankly the stuff that uh our markets are clamoring for you know something rational mm. and reasonable and interesting so i rather think it would be turned down by the jane austen society uh, <laughs> no i don't Janine, what what a, what a good uh, and constructive response. I I I I think that's very heartening to hear. And uh, yeah, you should uh, uh, take that up, Hewitt. And uh, one has nothing to lose but 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 a few stamps or whatever, sending something. So I, well, I think it's worth and, doing. And now, because all submissions mostly are, are done. E exactly. Yeah, that's me, a bit yeah. out of date. Still, know, isn't it? I know, I know, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean it'll be easy easy yeah. to do. Yeah, and, exactly. and in fact, you're, uh, do, you you're idea, do you have an idea of a journal that would you think might take it? I will. Um, I'll research. I'll research it and, and get it to you because I, I, I find it absolutely fascinating. I don't hmm. know the Jane Austen Society people. I don't know them personally. Um, so I, I can't make any uh, uh, predictions on how they would receive this. But the the general audience, uh, especially the literary journals, are are definitely looking for what Americans think is controversial. It's not in the sense that the way you present your argument, I don't think it's a controversy at all. Obviously, this Shakespeare person did not write these plays. I mean, we can read them now and we say, oh, my God, this is poetic, this is, this is enthralling. You know, um, I don't know how they felt back then, but it was wonderful now. So um, but let, let me research for mm. you that and I will I will get back to you on that. Oh, um, that, that's, that's very good of you. That's, yeah, that's that, that would be very kind of you. I much appreciate it. Shall I give you my email? Yeah, or we can, I mean, Janine, you can contact, I mean, we've got both emails, Michael mm. and, and We've I, got both so, emails, so we can. You know, it's, it's not a problem. We, yeah, we, a small we, we, service we of the society. In that yeah, case. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think on that positive note, we should uh, possibly end it. Well, thanks very much, Hewitt, for presenting I, I, it. I, I, yeah, I just wanted oh, to throw in, sorry. just really showing off, but I'm really pleased with myself. I wonder if I found a reference. It only occurred to me with that thing with Touchstone. Was it pouring a, a, a cup into a, a, a glass? Well, the French for glass is verre. I just, just no, yeah, it was a very good, very good. Yeah, well done. Okay, well done. Yeah, I was rather pleased with myself because it just yeah. came to me as you were yeah, talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well done. Well <laughs> just done. a bit well of fun. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Who good knows? Stuff. And, be... and uh, on that sort of note, I mean, there's so many of these things, but for example, is Le Conte d'Hiver. Yes, Michael, have you got that? I, I just noted down Le Comte d'Hiver, yes. I don't know if you've, you've said something after that. Or no, no, I didn't. I, it's, yep, it's, right. it's a similar, a similar point that you're you're making. And I, I oh, Comte d'Hiver, yeah. yeah. OK, yeah, you got it, got it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so, well, so, thank, thanks for it very much. And um, yeah. Yeah, that's... thanks, um, Hewitt. You were competing against uh, wonderful summer weather, but it's the quality and, of the attendance more than the quantity. And also, also the, the uh, internet was not good, but there you are. It's like the weather really, isn't it? it? It seems to, yeah, sometimes that is the case, that the connections are not stable. But but uh, you, you you persevered and we persevered as well. So, so that's good. All right, then. Um, thank, thanks thank very you, much. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. And a big thank and you to Hewitt. Yeah, and thanks, Janine, for, 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 for coming. Always a pleasure to, to, to have your company. Um, all right. Well, yeah. Enjoy the rest of the uh, rest of the day, and I think next meeting we'll be reading some Ryder Haggard, which would be fun. If, I think that'd be nice. That together, yes. Yeah, that'd be easy to do. It's yeah, that'd be good. Mm -hmm. All right.
Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks goodbye, very much. Goodbye, everyone, and see you in a month, Bye. I hope. Goodbye. Yeah. Bye-bye, bye-bye.